Welcome to this video on how to assess psychological responses in research. So today we're going to be covering the following key idea and areas of learning. So it's really important that you understand that there are three different ways that you can assess psychological responses in research. Okay, um, And we also need to talk about content analysis which happens in focus groups. So these are the three methods that you can use to, I guess, obtain data in psychological research. So one, objective quantitative, two, subjective quantitative, and three, qualitative. So objective quantitative, we know these definitions already, um, but just to give you a bit of a recap, objective um, measures, these can be directly observed and verified, and quantitative data is to do with numbers. Okay. Now obj objective quantitative measures, they collect numerical data using objective methods. So all I've done here is pulled those definitions together. Um, and examples of these might be things like heart rate, behavioural counts, scores on standardised intelligence tests, things that you're, um, you're getting numerical data that's objective. Now, the advantages of, of this method is, number one, you can see really clear patterns in data because it's quantitative, you're seeing the patterns there. It's very accurate and precise um, because you're not relying on opinions. You are getting actual measurements um, and these are objective as well. And because they're objective, they are less biased. Now, disadvantages, um, one disadvantage really is we need to check for validity. So you need to be really sure that that measure is actually measuring what it's supposed to. So for example, can you use a heart rate to measure stress levels? Um, or is that perhaps measuring something else? Now, the second method, subjective quantitative method. So um, we know that this is based on people's self-reports um, and it's numerical. So subjective quantitative measures collect numerical data using subjective methods. So an example is responses on checklists and rating scales. You can have scores on personality tests as well. Um, so we've got things like a Likert scale. So you guys will know from school having to fill out surveys that you often are given a statement and you have to rate your agreement from either strongly agree to strongly disagree. Okay. You can sometimes have a rating scale from 1 to 10 or you can place a mark on a line, I guess, to indicate the percentage of your support or agreement. So advantages of this, it is very easy to collect, it's easy to access, um, and you can report on a measure then re rather than refer to the measurement. So I guess what that means is that you can explain that a little bit more. Um, you can go into a little bit of depth about um, the question they were responding to and what it means that they've answered that way. Okay. Disadvantages, um, ratings can sometimes be tricky both as a participant and a researcher. Um, participants can fake responses or lie, and not because they're deliberately trying to muck up your research, but to give, I suppose, socially desirable responses. Maybe they're not focused, they don't completely understand the question. Lots of different reasons. Um, bias can also be an issue, um, particularly for the participant there. They could be, again, influencing their own results. You can be a little bit unsure as to whether their response is a valid reflection of what they're thinking or what is actually the case. So this is also kind of related to that fake response idea. Maybe they haven't understood the question and so they've answered it in a way that they're answering a, a totally different question and therefore your measure isn't measuring what it's supposed to, so it's invalid. There can also be subtle pressures here. So if you know that you're filling out a survey for your teacher, Perhaps it's a hard copy and you have your name on it and it's going to your teacher right before report time. You're probably not going to be totally honest if their class is the least favourite and perhaps you haven't liked it um, and you know you have some negative opinions. So there can be some subtle pressures there as well. The third one, so qualitative methods. We know that these are descriptions and qualitative methods are always subjective. Okay, so they always um, use subjective methods. So for focus group and the Delphi technique, researchers use something called content analysis. So let's have a bit of a look at this because we know it's one of our areas of learning. This is the procedure that researchers use to make sense of the underlying meaning of qualitative data. So you get a whole bunch of these um, verbal or written responses and you're trying to make sense of that now. So researchers study the details, the innuendos, the implications of the content, and they might look for things like recurring themes. So in a discussion about 
a particular topic has a certain theme or a few themes kind of sprouted out that you can, I guess, categorize that data. Now, this data is subjective as the researcher infers meaning as they interpret the data. So, you know that that person is filling out their own information um, and you're adding that extra level of subjectivity because the researcher is having to try and infer and understand what they've written and I guess infer some meaning from that as well. So um, content analysis of focus group responses, this is the process. So number one, you organise the data, you then identify some core themes or groups of comments that are quite similar. Number three is that you code the theme. So you give each of those groups, you give them a bit of a title to explain what they all have in common. You then keep track of these themes. So you record when they occur and where. You then analyse when participants agree or disagree or contradict one another or themselves. And number five, you then analyse these this data. And that's often done by presenting it in a table and then discussing it. So let's have a bit of a look. This is a content analysis table that I've taken from this website, so feel free to have a look. Um, but some of the themes that might have come out from a focus group are things like um, emotions when tired, behaviours, times when tired. You can see that the researcher has typed in here the frequency of these themes, so how often they've um, popped up and examples from participants. So what they would have had originally is just a whole bunch of this data and it's much easier to categorise it because then we can start to see patterns in that data as well. Okay, if you need any more information, as always, please see me or these resources. See you in class. Bye.